Hello and welcome to For Book Lovers Only, where we interview some great authors and talk about some amazing books. My name is Rob Brown, your host and chief book lover, and today we have a very accomplished author. She has written two books. She is a New York Times bestselling author and a Derringer nominated short story writer. Please welcome to For Book Lovers Only, Debbie Mack. Debbie, thank you so much for being here. Really happy to have you here. Thank you, Rob. I'm, I appreciate being here. Um, it is a particular honor to have you on the set because you are our first uh, New York Times bestselling uh, author. That's, that's an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations on that. I couldn't believe it when it happened. Actually, at the time, I was self-published, and uh, I ended up writing four books in the Sam McRae Mystery Series. But they are currently, the other books are currently out of print as they're being reissued by a publisher, Wild Blue Press. So how does one become um, a New York Times best-selling author? Like, what is the process for that? I wish I knew. I, <laughs> I wish I knew how it happened. Uh, I, all I know is that at the time, I had my book out as an e-book as well as a print book. And it was back in 2011. And I was selling a whole lot of books through Amazon. And I was also listed on uh, Barnes & Noble. So I was issuing uh, Nook copies as well. You know. Oh, I see downloads. And uh, I went through this extraordinary month where I sold amazing amounts. And uh, this was right around the time th that the New York Times announced that they were going to start putting ebooks on their bestseller list. And uh, I kept the price low. That was one thing that helped. It, they were 99 cent books. And I just crossed my fingers and hoped. And it happened. And, and it happened twice. And I was just floored. I couldn't believe wow. when it happened. <laughs> so, so there was no magic formula, just hard work on your part? I think it was hard work. There was marketing. I, I had five blogs at the time. Wow. I was doing book reviews for Mystery Scene magazine. I was blogging about my books, about my life as a writer. I was blogging about uh, the writing business, uh, book reviews, and a few other things. And I found that after a point, I had to really cut back on that because I was just overextending myself in terms of the way I was marketing. I see. But, um, but I am exploring other ways of marketing books. And one of them is to have a podcast. I have a podcast called The Crime Cafe. Oh, that's which right. Which you can get through iTunes or Google Plus or Google Play. I'm sorry, Google Play. And uh, I interview uh, crime, suspense, and thriller authors. And uh, it's available every two weeks. A new episode I put, put up every two weeks on iTunes. And, and, and how it's long also on my website. Okay, and how long have you been doing the Crime Cafe for? I've been doing it since July of this year. I see. And with regards to actually you writing, like where does your passion from writing come from? Oh, I've been passionate about writing all my life. And uh, I think it just comes from reading and watching movies. I got so caught up in television as well. I got so caught up in stories when I was a kid. I was the kind of kid that would have a book open, you know, and I'd be reading, and right. people would call my name, and I'd be so wrapped up in the story, I wouldn't You're so hear engrossed them. in it, right. Yeah. <laughs> I got so involved in the world of, of storytelling that um, I, when, I was, when I was a child, when I would watch TV, it's like I tell everybody, shh, don't say a word. I'm paying too much attention to what they're doing on screen, you know. I was just that kind of person. You know, I loved movies, I loved TV, and I loved books. Those and, three things. And what made you somewhat, like, take the, the plunge and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to write my first book? Well, you know, I'd been thinking about it all my life, and people had told me I was a good writer. And... Uh, I think I reached a certain age, and I said, you know, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? And that was in the mid-90s. And I started working seriously on a mystery, because I love different genres, but mysteries have always been one of my favorites. And um, <clears throat> in addition, I had heard that if you can write a mystery, you can write anything. So I thought, OK. I took it as kind of a challenge. Right in addition to the fact that I loved mysteries anyhow. And um, where was I going with this? What was your question? <laughs> well, we were just talking about, you know, what, what made you want to write. And oh, okay. The things that, the reason I wanted to write was I felt like I was running out of time 
and I just had to sit down and do it. I see. That's what it kind of comes down to. Now, you said the saying is, if you can write a mystery, you can write oh, yeah. anything. Why, why is that? What is it about that's unique about mysteries that... They're difficult to plot. Um, if you can plot a mystery well, you can probably plot a science fiction story well, because mysteries involve planting clues, but misleading people at the same time yet being fair with them. Right, I see. And then you have to ultimately get to an end that satisfies the reader in terms of how you wrapped everything up and uh, <clears throat> you know, at the same time doesn't leave a loose thread you know, that ties everything together Right. and makes sense. Right, that sounds like a daunting challenge. It and is. That's, that's where the Sam McRae series yes. was born. Tell us about right. Sam. Sam. Sam is interesting. She uh, was born in New York City, lived in Brooklyn, and uh, her parents uh, died in a plane crash when she was nine. So she was in like the system for a short while before her cousin came up from Maryland, basically, to uh, kind of retrieve her from right. that. And she grew up the rest of her life in Maryland, in Tacoma Park. and. Uh, as a result, she's, number one, a person who kind of distrusts authority. Number two, a person who is always on the side of the underdog. And three, a person who has kind of had to raise herself in a sense because her cousin was kind of like a older sister slash mother figure. I see. So it was kind of like being raised in her teen years by an older sister. And so she, she's very self-reliant and independent and strong. And, and what is the premise of identity crisis? What is Sam facing in that particular book? In this book, uh, she has a client who came to her about a domestic abuse matter, but then disappeared. And the police come to her, including an FBI agent, and say, we want to find your client. Her uh, ex-boyfriend is dead, has been murdered. And she's like, whoa, I have no idea where she is. And um, then she finds out that her client might have been involved in an identity theft scheme that was oh. targeted toward not only herself, but other people at the bank where she worked, or w where she banks. And things get very complex from there on. Okay, and is that's I where, Yes, that's where the story rises out of. And is Identity Crisis, that's in, in the Sam McRae series, is it like the mm -hmm. first book, the second book, or? It's the first book. It's the first book. It's the first book I published, at any rate, not the first one I wrote. <laughs> I see. And how, ma how many other Sam McRae books do you have that you've written? I have three others that are going to come back into print eventually. One is Least Wanted, which is a, a twin story of a, a juvenile uh, who gets into trouble and is involved with the girl gang in Prince George's County and a, uh, a white-collar embezzler one who has been accused of embezzlement at any rate, who happens to be the nephew of her mentor. And the two cases end up being intertwined. Oh, That's I least see. wanted. Riptide takes place in Ocean City. She's on vacation and uh, she's trying to relax. And her best friend, Jamila, who is uh, sharing a, a place with her, is accused of murder. Oh. So Sam gets involved in trying to help the local attorney investigate what's going on with that. I see. And the fourth one is uh, Deep Six. And in that one, Sam gets involved in a uh, citizens group with, uh, who is trying to fight a development in southern Prince George's County. And the uh, person who convinces her to get involved with the group um, who is head of the group, is murdered. Oh. And she was an old friend from college. I see. So there's the tie there. Okay. So for, for the books, for these mystery books, was it easier to write the second and the third, or they, each one is like a challenge in and of itself? Does it get each easier? Each one, it definitely does not get easier. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the ideas, I keep coming up with ideas, and it's like, where do I go with this one? And where do I go with that one? And what order do I want to go in? And uh, 
the, the cool thing about a series is that you can bring characters back and um, <clears throat> just, you know, take what, what you had before, bring them back, and create this kind of overarching arc of story that sort of ties everything together. I see. Now, so I keep thinking about bringing back a character, say, from the second book to affect her in the like, fifth book or oh. sixth book. Right, so that, that really keeps the, the readers and the book lovers engulfed exactly. in the series. Yeah. So for, I noticed that your books, a lot of them take place in, in, the, in this area, in the Maryland, D.C. area. You mentioned Tacoma Park. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, Prince George's County. Yeah. Um, tell the, the book lovers who are watching, who are maybe in another part of the country or another part of the world, tell them why you want to center it around this particular area. Well, this area is very interesting. I think it has such an interesting demographic mix right. and such an interesting mix of incomes among different demographics. Now, I was particularly interested in Prince George's County, but I live in Howard County. And the more I learn about that place, the more interested I get in that, too. Uh -huh, I see. It's kind of like the world of the uh, Baltimore, Washington area, to me, is rich with stories about all sorts of people. No, oh, absolutely. And um, that's what it comes down to, coming up with the characters, interesting characters. And you can find them all over the place here. And there are issues I see discussed in the paper that just spark story ideas in me. Right. And so I think the Baltimore, Washington area in general is a great place for all sorts of stories. You've got the federal presence right. and the Absolutely. local presence. Right. And the potential there is endless. <laughs> right, exactly. So for, do you have a particular process? It sounds like um, you know, writing a mystery novel is, like you say, a, a very daunting challenge. Do you have mm -hmm. a, a unique process for how you keep facts and make sure that there are no plot holes and make sure there are no loose ends untied? Do you have a, a unique process or how do you keep track of all that? Well, I don't know if it's unique, but I do try to at least keep track of who has what eye color and uh, what they've done. You know, keep a little biography of each character as I create them. I see. And uh, as far as verifying facts and things, I, I'll do some research on the internet, but sometimes I find it necessary to call people and just ask, you know, People, are experts, you know, I, I might find through internet searches or just finding somebody I know in, in the writing community who might have the answer. Exactly. Sometimes it's a, if it's a legal question, I can do the legal research. I used to practice law. And um, occasionally I'll ask a lawyer, you know, what would this happen in this situation? Um, I'm working on a thriller now, actually, that involves scientific issues and track down a scientist through my brother, who works as a scientist, I see. Um, to discuss what he thought the possibilities were. And he was like, yeah, I could see that happening. Oh, OK. So, so you're really uh, doing a lot of hands-on research. I do try, yeah. I do try to verify key things here and there. I figure some of it I can just make up. But you know, as long as it's plausible, you know. I, I try to, you know, verify the things that people will stumble over. Right. That's basically it. You Understood. Know. And you also have another book called Invisible Me. Uh, yes. The character is Portia Maddox. Yes. Tell us about Portia. Portia is an interesting character. She kind of came at me out of the blue one day, and I, I thought, yeah, you know, I, I just went and wrote quickly down. It was like she was speaking to me. And I said, okay, you know, so I wrote that down. And that ended up being the beginning of the book. And um, she's a 13-year-old albino girl who has lived all around the country and never fit in anywhere. Her dad was in the military. And um, she, she lands in this school in Florida near, uh, I want to say, Pensacola. Pensacola. That's it. Mm -hmm. And um, the most popular girl in school comes to her and says, I have a problem. I need you to spy on my boyfriend. I can't ask anybody else. <laughs> you're, you're the only person who can do this because she's so, so 
so much an outsider. She doesn't want to tell any of her popular friends. And, um, and Portia's like, well, I don't know. And she says, well, tell you what, I will invite you to my big birthday party if you do this. And Portia's like, oh, OK, you know? Right. So it's a way, kind of like a foot in the door with this popular crowd, which she just is just not used to. And um, the complications arise when um, Portia, first of all, starts to develop feelings for the boy. <laughs> yeah, that, that can be complicated. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> and secondly, there's another a friend named Judy, who is also kind of an outsider. And Portia has to balance her um, alle allegiances to Judy with those to Denise, the popular girl. And what happens is, I hope, an unexpected series of twists uh. as far as the relationships between all the characters in the book, because all these people have secrets that they're not telling each other. <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> and it gets very interesting. Um, the end has a big twist, a big huge twist. And <clears throat> I'm actually thinking about turning this into a series. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. Is this going yeah. to be a series? Because it sounds like uh, Portia I, has a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that can happen to her. Yeah, and, uh, I, yeah. Uh, I started thinking about it and I thought, you know, this is actually the perfect start of a series was an arc that would go from her from age 13 to age 16. Right. And possibly beyond. Right. Depending now this, on how well it does. This is in the young adult genre. Now you'd mentioned earlier you like to do a lot of hands-on research. Yes. Uh, when you were kind of devising the character of Portia Maddox, did you did you talk to any 13 year olds or did you just come your own experience when you were 13? I really just kind of tapped into that that old experience, you know? It's kind of like there are certain things you go through in adolescence that seem to be universal. I see. That are true for anyone. I mean, even kids today on the internet can relate to the sort of feelings that she's having. It, it's not a matter of technology or, or slang or right. <laughs> popular culture. It's all a matter of her inner feelings about herself. I see. So and how she deals with others. So if someone, if our book lovers who are watching want to learn more about Sam, want to learn more about Portia, uh, do you have a website where they can visit? Absolutely. It's uh, www.debbymack.com, which is spelled D-E-B-B-I-M-A-C-K. Great. And do you have, other than Invisible Me, maybe developing more um, novels than that, do you have any other works other than the, the scientific novel that you're going to be doing? Oh my gosh. Well. Um, the, uh, other than the thriller, I'm working on screenplays now. Wow. I have a screenplay that's going to be in the spotlight at Script DC this year. Oh, amazing. And actually made the finals in two screenplay contests this year, as well as the second round at the Austin Film Festival last year. So it's been coming along, and I've been working on it since 2009, actually, making amazing. little changes here and there. And I recently optioned my first novel it, as a movie to a local producer. Whoa, that's big. It is. It's huge. And uh, I wrote the screenplay for that. I adapted my own book, <laughs> which was a challenge. Right. Because I thought, oh my God, you know, what parts do I cut? What do I change? Uh -huh. <laughs> writing a screenplay is very different, similar, but different than writing a book. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Well, Debbie, it sounds like you have uh, a lot of uh, writing ahead of you, and we're, oh, yeah. uh, we're really excited about you know, all of the great novels and screenplays and, and, and the Crime Cafe uh, and just uh, staying up on your success. So thank you so much for stopping by. Certainly. It was my pleasure. And absolutely. And as you come out with more novels, we look forward to seeing you again here. Thank you. I look forward to coming. And thank you for watching For Book Lovers Only. If you want to pick up a copy of Invisible Me or Identity Crisis, please feel free to stop by at www.forbookloversonly.com. And while you're there, you can get on our mailing list. Also, make sure you visit The Village at www.villageconnector.com. We want to thank Debbie for being our guest today, and we want to thank you for watching. My name is Rob Brown, your host and chief book lover, and we'll see you again. And remember, next time, if you love books, we have a home for you. Take care.